So this is my last, uh, my last evening here at St. Mark's until the fall. We're going to be moving into the summer series where the classes will be led by members of the community. And I, I want to talk about two things that I think are really critical to, to practice and to staying awake. So the, uh, there are two titles. Uh, one is The Nature of Karma. And the other title, which I like a little better, is Dude, You Totally Had It Coming. <laughs> I wanted to talk about impermanence, the importance of recognizing and remembering impermanence, and to talk about the law of karma, and how having that awareness of the law of karma can be, be a transformational practice. So I'm going to talk a little bit about impermanence, a little bit about karma, a little bit on, on how intentions and actions play into your karma, your destiny, and talk a little bit about the wheel of samsara, the, the wheel of becoming, and how do, we, how do we get off that wheel. So we had our, our IMCW spring retreat, and uh, it was a wonderful retreat really recommend if you can find the time to uh, set aside some time for some time of intensive practice. Sound isn't good? Uh, maybe up. Can we try maybe a, a little more volume, Marlon? We'll, we'll stay on it. We'll get it. So how is that? Is that better? Great. Okay, good. Wonderful. So at the end of the retreat, we have a little time where we talk about how to, how to transition from a time of intensive practice to back to a worldly life where you're going to get distracted. So there are all kinds of things with a daily practice, being with like-minded people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but James Barrows is one of the senior teachers at, at Spirit Rock. The very last thing he said, Remember impermanence. So this was the most important teaching from the Buddha, where he constantly said, reflect on impermanence. And he actually offered what are called five daily recollections. And these recollections were offered to, to both uh, monastics, as well as lay people, as well as young people, as well as old people and to reflect on these every day as a way of remembering impermanence and re remembering the law of karma. So they're not exactly initially very happy recollections, <laughs> but I just lost sound. Oh, I think our battery may have gone. Yes. Um, I can keep going. In the meantime? Okay, 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 okay. So, so, so. So these, these five daily recollections are something that will inevitably, if you, if you reflect on them with a sense of authenticity, a sense of sincerity, they will remind you about the laws of what governs this human incarnation. So the first one is to remember, I am of the nature to grow old. I cannot avoid aging. I am subject to illness and infirmity. I cannot avoid illness and infirmity. I am of the nature to die. I cannot avoid death. I will be parted from all that is dear and beloved to me. I am the owner of my actions and the heir of my actions. Actions, I think we have sound. Actions are the womb from which I have sprung.
the fruits of my actions, both wholesome and unwholesome, skillful and unskillful, those I will inherit. So the first of these is remembering that everything changes. When we fall into when we fall into the trance, we believe that things are permanent. We believe that we're not going to get sick, that we're not going to old, not going to get old, that we're not going to die. We believe that everyone around us is going to stay the way they are. Remembering that all things change completely reshapes our relationship to life and directly impacts our stress and our suffering. This is the fundamental truth, that life is change, and that truth is change. And it's interesting, as I've been teaching meditation and mindfulness in, in all kinds of settings, whether it be a, a corporate setting or teaching at the World Bank or teaching in high schools or you know, teaching just you know, regular classes, it always comes down to this recognition that all stress is related to your relationship to change. There's a, a stimulus response. Something happens and you react. Most of the time, we're, we're reacting blindly to stimulus and we're kind of like a pinball in a pinball machine. Most of our, our, most of our life, when we're stressed, is all about reacting. And mostly it's about avoiding domination or trying to dominate. As soon as you recognize there's another option, which is to slow things down, you realize that you can cooperate with change. There's that great saying that says, it's much easier to ride a horse in the direction it's already going. <laughs> another famous line is that if, you've, if you fight with reality, you're going to lose. So it's a lot easier to learn how to work with it. And you can only work with reality by understanding how reality works and understanding how your mind works. And that's where this practice of mindfulness is considered a practice that's not just about becoming more free, but actually truly liberating yourself. And I'll talk about that a little bit more at the end. So recognizing that you are going to die, you are going to get sick, you are going to become uh, old, and everything you love, everything that is near and dear to you is going to fall away. Now on the one hand, that's really grim. On the other hand, it opens up an incredible doorway to gratitude, to embracing what is here, to, to celebrating what is here. I was reminded, uh, as I was thinking about this talk, of this story. This was a couple of years back. You may, may recall this. It was at 495 and the 270 interchange, which is the, the busiest intersection in the, in the United States, I believe. There was a story of this, of this guy who um, he had an MBA and a law degree and uh, two young children, it was a real up-and-comer, just a really active and loving his life. And there was a, a log truck crossing over 270. And by some freak accident, the, the, log, the logs were released from the truck, fell on his car just as he was going under the underpass. And he was killed instantly. I was so struck by the random quality of that. Who knew when he left and kissed his kids that morning to get in the car to go to work that it could be over just like that. Remembering that can be very, very helpful. So the Buddha went on to reflect on the following. The language is a little bit clunky. I am the owner of my actions and the heir of my actions. Actions are the womb from which I have sprung. The fruits of my actions, both wholesome and unwholesome, skillful and unskillful, I will inherit. So 
As you give, you get. This idea of karma is not just limited to Buddhism. The phrase, as you sow, so shall you reap. What goes around comes around. A quote from the Bible, do not be deceived. A person reaps what he sows. This is embedded in, in Christian thought as well. There's a, a golden rule of Confucianism as well, where Tzu Kung was asked, is there one word which may serve as a rule of practice for all of one's life? Confucius answered, is not reciprocity such a word? What you would not want done to yourself, do not do to others. It's so simple. And you may remember when you first heard the golden rule. Did something click for you? Did something resonate? I remember the first time I heard it, I thought, that makes sense. I could feel it as a, as a, a kind of a guiding principle. Of course, I forgot it. But then I remembered it every now and then. And it's the remembering of it that's very, very important. A little shout out to Bill Cosby, who I remember uh, when I was young. He refined it as do unto others before they do unto you. <laughs> so really understanding this law of karma, as you sow, so shall you reap, has immediate impact on our lives. Sometimes the law of karma is, is, is sort of uh, interpreted as sort of predeterminism, that there are causes and conditions that are set in place, which means you're, you're sort of fated to go in a different direction, which is actually the opposite of what the Buddha taught. The Buddha taught that no matter what your causes and conditions, which are the result of former, former actions, that you can create your karma by how you relate to your experience. So you actually have the option of creating your karma. The Buddha said you are the owner of your thoughts, of your speech, and your actions. And through your thoughts, your speech, and your actions, you influence your future. Ajahn Sumedho, who's a, a British monk, just made a side comment once in one of his talks. He said, he said, I've never, he, he said, I never understood this. He said, if you really believe in karma, why would you hold on to revenge? And I thought about that, and I thought, it, it sort of shifted the way when I would sort of see people who were being very, very unskillful, of recognizing that, that their actions were, were coming out of their own suffering. And by acting in that manner, they were creating more suffering for themselves. As the Buddha said, when you, when you act in anger, it's like you're picking up a hot coal to throw at the other person. And you don't realize that it's your hand that is burning. That holding on to, to anger and hatred is, is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. We're actually poisoning ourselves. There's a, a certain story that really kind of bent my brain a little bit in this understanding of karma. And these are the story of, of some Tibetan monks who were being severely tortured in prison. They were asked later when they were released after many years, why didn't they just give up and die? And they said that they did not want their tormentors to take mm -hmm. on the karma of killing them. So it was out of, out of their compassion that they, they stayed present. <sighs> really hard to take that one on. They, they didn't want the jailers. They didn't want the jailers to kill them so that they would, that they would have to take on that karma. So how do we become more aware of our karma and how do we influence our karma? And I think it really comes down to 
being aware of intention and being aware of your actions, being aware of your habits. So I've been in a personal dilemma, not a big dilemma, but a dilemma. The first hummingbirds showed up at our house about three days ago. The dilemma became, do I feed the hummingbirds or do I not feed the hummingbirds? Last year we fed the hummingbirds and we had an amazing, they were going through a gallon of nectar a day. We had a lot of hummingbirds. I, of course you can't count them because they're all over the place. And, but I got to watch the hummingbirds all summer and they're really nasty little dudes, I have to say. They are not pleasant little creatures. They spend most of their time attacking each other. But nonetheless, <laughs> the question was, do I feed the hummingbirds, do I not feed the hummingbirds? Is it, is it actually a benefit to provide um, sugar water to the hummingbirds? Or am I artificially stimulating hummingbird growth? <laughs> but then the real karma was, if I, if I feed the hummingbirds, then I've got to keep feeding the hummingbirds. Because what if I feed the hummingbirds and for some reason I forget when they're having their, all their little babies and they require so much nutrition, do I want to take that on? And it reminded me when I, I grew up on a farm where I was responsible for about 40 sheep from a pretty young age. And I, there were a couple days where I, was, I wasn't really that attentive to the sheep. And I went to water them one day and they were really dehydrated. And so I, they, they just drank and drank and drank and I felt so terrible uh, of the suffering that I had created from my own, just out of my own ignorance. So that weighed heavily on me. So that's what my mind does in meditation. But every, every choice that you make has consequences. For me, there was just a very simple thing of, oh, wouldn't it be great to have hummingbirds around? But then I realized the responsibility in that act. Was I adding, creating benefit, or was I artificially messing up with nature? So I decided to feed the hummingbirds but with a very deep commitment to make sure that they were fed all through the summer. Our actions impact our future. And I've been a little bit of a self-improvement kick recently. I have, a, I have a big project. I'm doing an eight-hour audio training for Sounds True uh, at the end of August. And I realized it's about 100 days from now. So I'm sort of making my 90-day plan to make sure that I had everything in place because I, I want to create a really helpful product. So I just started thinking about, well, if I was, was to take on a 90-day or 100-day project, what kind of habits would I want to reinforce to kind of to build in? So I decided to make a list of, of the things I wanted to do on a daily basis and then evaluate at the end of 90 days. Would, would this be beneficial or not? So I'm about four or five days into it. And it's been very interesting to see the kind of the consequences so far uh, of what I've decided to take, to take on. So I'll just, uh, I'll just tell you what I'm, uh, what I'm measuring every day. I'm, I'm meditating every day, but I also made a commitment to write down my observations of what I noticed in my, in my meditation practice. Um, I've made a commitment to exercise every day and again to kind of note what I did. Um, I'm doing a little bit of yoga every day. I think I've shared here before that I hate yoga. <laughs> but, I've, but I've committed to, teach, to do one sun salutation, which takes me, you know, you know, eight to ten minutes. But to do just one every day. I, I play music every day. I do some photography and some video every day. I do one action item on this project. I have a, a check-in with my wife every day. I floss <laughs> every day. And I, I tend to skip meals. I'm just, I tend not to think about eating. So rather than 
make a whole thing around food. I'm just weighing myself every day, just as a way to kind of jog my awareness of, of, of keeping weight on. Now, what's been really interesting is I've tried this before, and it hasn't worked. So I've made up some new rules. There's a certain rule that many meditators find, that they, when they make a commitment to meditation, their commitment is to this. Assume the position. Doesn't matter how long you meditate, assume the position. And just assuming the position, sometimes you pop right back up, sometimes you might sit for a minute, sometimes a little bit longer. So that's part of my strategy. Rather than go into a whole big thing around diet, I'm just, I'm just weighing myself and writing it down. Rather than the whole thing around what kind of music I'm gonna play and for how long, even if it's three notes, I've done it. And what's been interesting is I'm feeling really great. So far, so good. It feels really good. And what I've noticed is that by just playing a little bit of music every day, there's a cumulative, cumulative effect to it. It sort of shapes my, my day. I'm a little more aware of sounds. I'm a little more of, like, of what I'm working on and how that might play into the next, the next little exploration that I do. Sometimes it's just for a few moments. Sometimes I just get off onto a really cool roll where I'll play for 15 or 20 minutes. Oftentimes, for example, when it comes to doing the yoga, I don't want to do it. But I have this checklist because I'm measuring it. After I do that one sun salutation, I'm stunned at how good I feel. And I can already feel my spine a little more aligned. All of those actions have consequences. If I can stay with it, at the end of 100 days or 90 days, I'm imagining that I'll be deeply enriched by, by these particular disciplines. It'll require a fair bit of effort to stay on track, et cetera, et cetera. So I thought it might be interesting just to do a little reflection, just a short meditation. If you like, you can close your eyes. When the Buddha taught about reflecting on karma, one of his suggestions was to, was to reflect on the consequence of action. You might like to, just for this, these next few minutes, just to reflect on either a, a, a positive habit that you have or maybe an unhealthy habit that you have. Just selecting one. And just sort of sensing what it's like when you engage into it on a, on a regular basis. And then you might sort of project out into the future with either this positive or wholesome or unwholesome habit. If this continued and maybe became more, more expressed over days and days or weeks or weeks, what do you sense as the, the consequence or the, the fruit of that particular habit? We'll just take a, a minute to reflect on that. And then if you like, you can. So, you, you, so your reflection was on, on, on not making a choice. Not making a choice, but a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, choosing not to choose and then reflecting on, well, what would the consequence of that be? Yeah. Uh-huh. Did you have a sense of it? Was, it? was it sort of wholesome or unwholesome? <laughs> it all depends, yes. It always depends, yeah. But it's an interesting thing to reflect on, like to not make a choice. What, what is the end result of that? Yeah, yeah. 
So, so reflecting on karma can be a very, very helpful thing with, with any one activity, with any one choice, to really contemplate what is the outcome of this. And, and this is what the Buddha taught around sort of the brutal honesty that comes in reflecting on your life and your practices. With any given practice, any spiritual practice you might try on, to give yourself to it fully and then to ruthlessly evaluate what is the karma of this? Is this creating a more wholesome state or is this creating a less wholesome state? And then making, making a choice from there. In neuro-linguistic programming, they often talk about one of, the, one of the, the best ways to affect change. Let's say you, um, you want to stop smoking. Is you reflect on the outcome of not making the change. And if you really want to make a change, to, to really focus on the negative aspect of that. You know, go to a cancer ward you know, and sit with people and explore what that's like. And then to affect uh, massive pleasure to making the change. You know, think about the, how good you'll feel or the, what you'll do with the money you'll save by not smoking. So every action has consequences. And the habits that you build in will have direct impact on your life. And Deepak Chopra says, if you want to assess your health habits, take a look at your body right now. If you want to get a sense of your future body, take a look at your habits right now. Your actions have direct consequence. So there's short-term karma and there's long-term karma. You can engage into some activity which may not be very healthy and it may not have immediate impact but it may have a long-term long consequence. Now when we start looking at cause and effect, there's sort of the, your immediate personal karma, and then of course there are the cause and effect that, that play into much larger rhythms. You know, we're all participants in a particular culture you know, that um, has gone through its own particular waves of sort of coming and going. We, we uh, many of us grew up in kind of a, a time in our culture of unprecedented wealth. And that has its karmic consequences as well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's called the wheel of samsara, because this plays into karma. The, uh, the Hare Krishnas have a, have a model. If, you're, if you've ever seen where they have, might have a booth set up somewhere, um, I remember back when there were a lot more Hare Krishnas around. But, it, but every, every uh, little collective had this, this um, like a little model or a statue. And it showed um, a little, a little uh, baby being born and crawling. Then the next little statue was uh, a, little, a little boy standing and walking. The next little statue was a young man running. The next statue was, was an older man uh, walking slowly. The next little statue was, was an old man bent over with a cane. The next statue was a corpse. The next was sort of primordial ooze. The next was a baby being born. The next was uh, a, a young boy walking. And the whole teaching in here, of course, was about the cycle, about the, the cycle of birth and rebirth and about the wheel of samsara, how our, this life is driven by three major forces. It's driven by the force of wanting. It's driven by the force of greed. It's driven by the force of aversion, uh, of, of anger, of ill will. And it's driven by the force of confusion. And in, in, in Buddhist language, these are referred to as the three poisons. These are the three qualities of mind that, that make it impossible to be present. And of course, every one of us has these seeds of desire, the seeds of aversion, and the seeds of confusion. And so when we are caught in this, this cycle of desire, we are on this wheel of becoming. 
a constant process of moving toward the next thing. And we can see it in small cycles, we can see it in big cycles. In the small cycles, that, that thing that you really, really want, you obsess on it, you think about it, you finally get it, you have it, and then the luster kind of fades. As my guru in the ashram used to say, you know, when you're young, you're thinking about, oh, I'm just, I'm so, so tired of being single. If I could just get into a relationship, you know, then I'd be happy. And you're, then you're in a relationship. You think, you know, if we could just commit and be married, then, then I'd be happy. And then it's, you know, maybe if we had some kids, it would stabilize our relationship a little bit. And then after a little while, it's like, you know, if we could just get the kids out of the house, then I think we'd really be okay. And once they're out of the house, if I could just get rid of this person, be single again, then I know I'd be happy. So that this constant drive for more, for seeking pleasure, avoiding pain, when, when we're on this cycle, it is a never-ending cycle. Chasing happiness, chasing peak experiences, the drive to, to avoid unpleasantness, the fear of shame, the fear of illness, the fear of failure. All of these forces drive us and keep us on the wheel of samsara. So how do we get off the wheel of samsara? This is where mindfulness comes in of non-judging awareness. It can happen in any moment when you realize that you are under the spell of desire, when you're under the spell of fantasy, of wanting, of clinging. In that moment of non-judging awareness, the wheel stops. It can be a moment of freedom. Any moment when you realize that you are, you're being driven by fear, that, that fear is a motivator, the fear of failure, fear of sickness, fear, fear of shame, fear of blame. By, by becoming aware of it, of holding it in non-judging awareness, you stop the cycle. And you stop the endless cycle of karma. In this last meditation retreat in one of the morning sits. Because I'm serving the retreat, I occasionally, you know, check email, make sure that everything's, the retreat's going along. And I just happened to see this little blurb about something that one of our political parties did. I read it just before my meditation. And of course, my mind fixated on this. And I could feel my First, it was irritation. And then that irritation sort of morphed into rage. The rage had all these flavors of anarchy and all kinds of wild stuff. And I was really, I was really caught up in it. At some point, mindfulness kicked in. And I was able to note it, able to label it, to realize this is rage. This is just blind rage. So I sort of shifted my attention to, to sort of feeling it in my body and, and just, it just sort of dissipated. And I actually felt a sense of spaciousness afterward. I was energized and spacious at the same time. I was struck later when I realized that if I had sort of read that story and didn't have the time to feel it play out through my body to sort of label it and release it, what would I have done? Maybe I would have been really irritated with someone. Maybe I never would have recognized that anger, but that, but that, that low-grade irritation would have colored everything I did during the day. So to, to, to step out of the wheel of samsara, to step out of the drive of, of constant craving and desire and aversion and ill will requires a practice. It requires self-awareness. 
And this is where the practice can serve us in ways that, that you can't imagine. When you can stop this a vicious cycle, just to note it, to be aware of it, to investigate it, to let it dissipate in some way, you've affected the outcome of your whole life. It's an amazing dance, it really is. So when you can remember impermanence, when you can remember that everything changes, and how you are relating to the change in your life will, de will determine the quality of your life. As Darwin said, it's not the smartest or the strongest that survive. It's the ones who are the quickest to adapt to change. Recognizing what is changing, your capacity to adapt directly related to your survival and your happiness. And when you can remember that every action has a result, has a consequence, and when you can design your life in a way that will help you to cultivate a greater sense of, of feeling whole, a greater sense of compassion, a greater sense of presence, you are shifting your life and the life of those around you. Boy, that's a really great question. So just to kind of rephrase the question, part of your struggle is how do you reconcile anger with injustice in the world? Yeah, that's been a big, a big question for me as well. For where I've kind of come to with that is that when there's injustice in the world and I, and I react in anger, I'll have a certain degree of effectiveness. When there's injustice in the world and I can act out of compassion, I have a different level of effectiveness. Of, what? of, of effectiveness in the world. You know, so we have these great models, you know, Gandhi and Martin Luther King, who, who affected enormous change, but they managed to do it by shifting their consciousness in, in quite a profound way. Does that help? It doesn't make it any easier to kind of process that anger. But, but I, I think of anger as emotion. It's, it's energy in motion. And it's actually something that can be utilized. And, and I found in my own, my own investigation of the anger, when I was feeling all that rage and um, everything that went along with it, that, that when I could sort of allow it and investigate it and make room for it, I was, I, was, I was energized, but I was also clear, which was a, a very, very cool experience. And we, tend to, we tend to not want to be around anger, but when we, can, when we can be with it, it's quite a powerful force. Yeah. So, so how do you, so just so I understand, so how do you kind of balance out sort of a practice that is very present, present focused with also something that has to do with the recognition of creating a future? Is that, is that, did I get that right? It's a, it's a great, yeah, it's a great question. And for me, there's, there's a real, kind of a realization that the, the only impact on, I have on my future is in the present. You know, if there's something I really, really want, the only way I can, 
affect any relationship to it is, is right now, my, my attitude right now. Does that make sense? And how I'm relating to my experience, and I think this is kind of the primary teaching in sort of Buddhist psychology, is, is how you're relating to your experience what has direct and immediate impact on what follows this moment. So, mm -hmm. So is the motivation the future? I'll give you a, Buddha, a Buddhist response. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would say primarily it, it's all about the here and now. And when we talk about the wheel of samsara, you know, of, of, of constantly being driven by these energies, and there are lots of, ener lots of energies that pull you away from the here and now. They're, they're the, in Buddhism, there are the three poisons of you know, greed, hatred, and delusion. There are also the five hindrances, which are uh, being lost in, in aversion or judgment, being lost in, in craving and wanting, being lost in, in worry and anxiety, being lost in sloth and torpor, and being lost in doubt and self-criticism. So those are like five other mental faculties that make it impossible to be present. And then there are others, there are the eight worldly winds, sort of the fears and desires of, of shame and blame, of health and ill will, or health, health and sickness, praise and blame, success and failure. So it's very, very challenging to be in a, in a clear space with equanimity. When, when we, just in sort of naming all these different forces that are, that are taking you away from the present moment, so part of the practice of mindfulness, or the practice of meditation, is, is learning how to recognize what's between you and feeling free. As soon as you can recognize those states, you get familiar with them, and they don't have the same, the same impact that they, that they have on you normally. Or as Ram Das said, at the end of my long life, doing all these spiritual practices, I've come to recognize I am neurotic as I've ever been. The only difference is now I'm friends with them. <laughs> what a difference. What a difference. So, so getting off that wheel of samsara doesn't mean that it all stops. Life still happens. But how you're relating to it can dramatically shift through cultivating more and more of a sense of non-judging awareness. I hope that helps. I'd be happy to chat with you more. Yeah. Yes? I just, uh, her question brought up a question for me. Is karma actually a Buddhist teaching or just a byproduct of the societies in which Buddhism often flourished? Well, so is, is karma a Buddhist teaching or is it part of the society in which Buddhism flourished? Here's my take, which could be deeply flawed. <laughs> what, I, what I feel is that um, the recognition of karma, of cause and effect, I believe is a perennial truth. I believe it's a truth that permeates human, the human condition. So it's a truth that is recognized in Christian thought, it's, a rec it's recognized in Confucianism, it's, it's pretty much recognized you know, universally. So this is where I think where the where the teachings take us to to the laws of the laws of nature, you know, the recognition of, of this. Um, I certainly believe in cause and effect, um, but I but I also think that there there are ways of looking at karma, which is sort of like astrology. You know, there's sort of the so what sign are you? And, and really drilling down into the deeper, subtler impacts of all the forces that make up, make up reality. So we can, look at it, we can look at karma through a very, very superficial lens. Or we can recognize the complexity of it. And part of the complexity is so beautifully articulated in, in the metaphor of, of Indra's net. If you're familiar with Indra's net, that, that this universe is, it, it, it is a net like a spider web. And every juncture of that spider web has a jewel. 
And the jewel in that juncture ref reflects the entire web within that one juncture in the web. Wow. Ooh, what a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so how do we distinguish between kind of, yeah, how do we distinguish between sort of wholesome desire and we could say unwholesome desire, the desire that perpetuates samsara. And this is when the Buddha had his awakening, one of his, his first, when he looked around, one of the first things he saw, he, in the rough translation, <laughs> is everyone is looking for happiness in exactly the wrong way. Everyone is looking for happiness in exactly the wrong way. That everyone is looking for happiness in, in things that are born out of causes and conditions. So people are looking for happiness through, through sense pleasure. Sense pleasures are subject to impermanence. So anything that you are looking for to be happy that is, that is subject to impermanence, is bound to create unhappiness. So I think this is part of where, and this is what a part of what I love about Buddhist psychology, that it's a self-regulating process. That that all we can really do is evaluate for ourselves. Is what I'm doing cultivating a more wholesome state or a less wholesome state? Now so for me in playing music, the only way I can create unhappiness in creating music is if I have any attachment to it. <laughs> Anything I hold on to, any story I tell myself about how great I'll be, it's not going to be fulfilling. If it can be an experience unto itself that, that awakens a, a greater sense of the here and now, then I would judge that to be a more wholesome, a, a wholesome practice. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So I'm aware of the time. Um, why don't we do a short yet brief meditation before we close? We'll reflect on, on these five recollections. And as you as you hear these words, just to let them resonate in your awareness. Number one, I am of a nature to grow old. I cannot avoid aging. Number two, I am subject to illness and infirmity. I cannot avoid illness and infirmity. Number three, I am of a nature to die. I cannot avoid death. Number four, I will be parted from all that is dear and beloved to me. Number five, I am the owner of my actions and heir to my actions. Actions are the womb from which I have sprung. The fruits of all my actions, wholesome and unwholesome, skillful and unskillful, I will inherit. In your own time, gently letting the breath deepen. You might, if you like, just to bring your hands in prayer position in front of your heart with your eyes closed and just take a moment to honor this day, your path, your journey. You might offer a little bow to yourself. Then if you like, you might gently open the eyes and just offer a, a 
silent greeting to the person on your left and right. Thank you for coming out tonight. May you and your karma have a wonderful evening together and beyond. A few quick announcements. Um, if you are interested in a men's retreat, I'm leading a men's retreat this Saturday um, at St. Luke's Episcopal in, uh, in Bethesda. They're a really wonderful gathering of men. Men of all traditions, backgrounds, orientations are welcome. Um, if you're interested in the Telesanga, which is an um, amazingly cool way to support you in your practice, there, uh, there are handouts over there, and, and Mo, Mo, maybe you can be around to chat with people as well. Um, thank you, as always, for your support for myself and the church. Yeah, and, and uh, yes, Marlon. Do you remind people about Monday and also uh, about Memorial Day? Service? Yes, uh, there is no class on Memorial Day on that Monday. And our summer series will start the following week. And one more. One more. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to the flowers with Kali this evening. Yes. Oh, let's take a moment. Kali um, is recuperating from hip surgery. He's doing really, really well. I talked to him uh, today. And if you'd like to contribute to flowers or something like that, you can see Marlon right over here. Great. Over here. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. And enjoy your summer. Yeah.